Okay. The first one is note taking. So does everybody have a notebook and a pencil in front of them? Okay. You have been given notebooks and pencils. Some jurors prefer to take notes as evidence is presented. Other jurors prefer not to do so. It is up to you individually to decide whether or not you want to take notes. It is not necessary nor required that you take notes. If you decide that you want to take notes during the trial, you may do so using the notebooks provided. Notes are not evidence, and you should not substitute for your rec independent recollection of the evidence. Remember that you are the judges of the believability of the witnesses. Your primary function is to see and hear the witness and observe other evidence. Do not let note-taking interfere with your careful consideration of the evidence. Each time that you are excused from the courtroom, please leave your notebook face down on your chair. When you are excused for the day, please do the same. The clerk will collect the notebooks from your chairs and will return them to your chairs prior to the next time you are to return to court. Your notes will be secure when not with you and will not be read by anyone. <coughs> when you begin your deliberations, you may have your notes with you. No juror's notes can be given more weight in your deliberations than the memory of a juror who chooses to carefully consider the evidence without taking notes. Accordingly, notes taken by any juror are to be used only as a memory aid for that juror. Do not look at another juror's notes and do not show your notes to anyone else. You may have also noticed that the testimony of witnesses was, is being tape recorded during the trial. That's this blue light. If during deliberations there is a dis... 16-year-old David Grunwald um, did not come home on the evening of November 13th, 2016, which was a Sunday night. Um, earlier in the day, he had pretty much spent the day with his girlfriend, Victoria McKelkey, and his mother, Edie Grunwald. Um, as, as the day went on, eventually he had to take Victoria to her mother's house first, and then to her father's house. And David had a curfew. Um, and he asked for a small extension of his curfew, which was granted, because his parents knew that he had to take Victoria home to her father's house. When he didn't come home, um, his parents became very concerned. Uh, David was usually very good about calling if he was going to run late, about abiding uh, by his curfew. And when he didn't show up at home, his parents got extremely nervous. Um, they started calling people, and they started looking for David. Uh, David was driving a Bronco, such as the one we have on the screen, that he and his dad uh, had been fixing up. And David, you will hear from Victoria loved the Bronco, and he loved to drive. Um, his parents originally, when David didn't come home on the evening of November 13, 2016, the initial thought his parents had was that maybe something went wrong with the Bronco. Or because it was wintertime, like it is now, maybe something happened where he slid off the road and was stuck someplace or wasn't found or couldn't get out of a ditch or whatnot. But before I tell you what happened, I have to get into the names of some people and what happened earlier in the day. Our case is gonna...
before I go any deeper, I'm going to have to explain to you the, the people that will be involved in this particular case. So let's go from, from the top row, left to right. First person on the left, Eric Almendinger. The person in the middle, top row, Dominic Johnson, the defendant in this case. The last person in the row for, top row furthest to the right, David Evans. Bottom row, left, Austin Barrett. Bottom row, right, Bradley Renfro. Earlier during the day on November 13th, 2016, David Grunwald received some texts from David Evans. David Evans was looking for a ride from Wasilla to Eric Almendinger's house in Palmer. Um, David knew, David Grunwald knew David Evans from school. Uh, they from both from he knew David Evans as a super senior because David, David was uh, 19, uh, but he was still going to school. Um, David Grunwald agreed to give David uh, Evans a ride to Eric Almendinger's home. And there were a couple of reasons why he agreed to give David Evans a ride. Number one, David Evans was an acquaintance. Number two, he had to take Victoria to her mother's house first. And Victoria's mother's house is a few blocks away from Eric Almendinger's house. And number three, David Grunwald liked to drive and, you know, it wasn't like him to turn down this type of request. So what happened was Victoria and David Grunwald left the Grunwald house at about 5.40 p.m. that day. And... They picked up David Evans at about 5.53 at Pioneer Pizza. He somehow got to that location, they picked him up. Um, David Grunwald drove to um, Victoria McKelkey's mother's house and he dropped Victoria there. She had to get some of her stuff. And then he took David Evans to Eric Almendinger's house, short distance away, just a matter of minutes. And when he dropped, David Evans off. He didn't get out of, David Grunwald did not get out of the car. When he dropped David Evans off, David suggested, David Evans suggested to David Grunwald that he come back later and hang out. David Grunwald, after dropping David Evans off, drove back to Victoria's mother's house and he picked up Victoria and her sister Lillian and he was going to drive them to their father's house, which was off of Smith Road in the Butte. Um, but, um, so after he picked them up, they did have to make one stop. Around 6.12 that evening, uh, David, David Grunwald, stopped at the car store in Palmer. And the reason he stopped at the car store in Palmer is because he noticed that the Bronco needed some fluid in the radiator. So he had a jug that he carried. The Bronco apparently had been having an issue. He had a jug in the Bronco. He went inside the car store. He was captured on the video tape there. Um, one of the car's employees filled up the jug with water. He came out and he put water in the radiator of the Bronco. He dropped uh, Victoria and Lillian off at the father's house without any incident at about 6.20 p.m. that evening. Um, and then when he was saying his goodbyes to Victoria, they knew they were going to see each other the next day. David had mentioned that he possibly was going to hang out with the boys for a little while. Um, and that was the reason he asked for the extension of his curfew. Victoria will tell you that he hadn't made his mind m made up yet about that because it was a school night. But I think, but we're going to show that he was thinking about taking up da taking David Evans, David Evans, up on the offer to come hang out with him in Eric Almendinger. And David Grunwald had been at Eric Almendinger's house before. And Victoria thought nothing of it. She, 
there was nothing unusual about that. They said their goodbyes, and um, David took off. Now, Victoria didn't think anything was wrong, but eventually she was contacted by Edie and Ben Gormley. And they told her that David had not come home. And she sensed that they were extremely concerned about David not coming home. And then she started taking certain actions. Uh, she, first of all, one of the first things she did was she texted David Evans. And she asked whether David Evans had seen her David. And David Evans responded that the last time he saw David Grunwald was when David Grunwald dropped him off at Eric Almendinger. And then uh, Victoria found a way to get in touch with Eric Almendinger. And she texted. At first, she didn't get a response from Eric Almendinger. But later, she did get responses from him. And essentially, he texted back saying that he was in Anchorage. Oh. He was drunk. Thank you. He was in Anchorage. He was drunk. And he hadn't seen her David. He hadn't seen David Grunwald. The evidence will show that David never came home. His parents never found him. His friends never found him. The search parties never found him. The search dogs never found him. And people doing air searches never found him. One of the issues in this case is going to be what happened to David Grunwald. And the answer that our evidence will provide to you folks is that David Grunwald walked into something that he had not anticipated. And he walked into something that he never could anticipate. This is what the evidence will show he anticipated. He anticipated going to Eric Elmendinger's house and hang out with some friends slash acquaintances. He had been there before. He knew David Evans. He knew Eric Elmendinger. He didn't think there was anything to be afraid of. And they were going to hang out either in the garage or in a camper trailer um, that was on the Elmendinger property. Um, Eric Elmendinger's father, Rodney Elmendinger, and his grandmother, Myler Elmendinger, was, were usually in the house. And typical of teenagers or young adults, they wanted to be on their own. And they, they tended to hang out in the garage or in the camper trailer. Now, that was what David anticipated. However, things changed on that evening. David Evans had a problem. And the problem was that he was staying with Eric Elmendinger at Eric Elmendinger's home. But he had left for a few weeks. Um, Rodney Elmendinger let him stay that. And Myler Elmendinger, the grandmother, and you'll find out that she really runs the Elmendinger household, let David Evans stay there, but he took off. And he took off for a number of weeks. And when, he, and when David Grunwald dropped him off at the Elmendinger home on November 13, 2016, he was basically asking or perhaps begging them to be able to stay at their house. Rod, you will find out that Rodney Elmendinger had a discussion with David Evans, a lengthy <coughs> discussion in the house. Uh, and you will find out that um, after that discussion, David Evans had a lengthy discussion with Myler Elmendinger. But the end result of those discussions were and Eric Elmendinger was part of it to an extent, but he wasn't doing as much talking. The end result was that the grandmother was not going to let David Evans stay at the house. But the reason it, why this is important 
is because the initial plot, what David anticipated was that he was going to hang out with Eric Elmendinger and David Evans. But because Eric Elmendinger and David Evans were in the house trying to persuade the, Eric's, Eric Elmendinger's father and grandmother to have David Evans remain uh, living there, David Grunwald ended up in the camper with people he didn't know very well. And those people were the defendant in this case, Dominic Johnson, who was 16, like David, Austin Barrett, who was 19, and Bradley Renfro, who was 16. And what he, what David did not anticipate. Objection is overruled, but noted for the record. Thank you. What David Grunwald did not anticipate is that the three people that he was with in the camper fancied themselves a gang. Um, they thought that they were Crips, that they had access. Objection is overruled, but noted for the record. Thank you. They had access to firearms, and the evidence will show that they were capable of extreme violence. Uh, one of their, you, another person that you're going to become familiar with during this trial is Devin Peterson. Um, he was basically the role model and advisor of uh, this group of Dominic Johnson, Bradley Renfro, Objection. Austin Barrett, Sorry, and Dominic. For the record, and for the record, I'm objecting to the photos being shown. Okay. Objection. And the argument being made by counsel. Okay. Um, defense has all the photographs, and this is what the state's going to present in the trial. So you can call it argument. I call it an opening statement. Um, back to Devin Peterson. He also thought that he was a crook. He also had access to firearms, and the others clearly looked up to him. Now, we're going to show more particularly as it goes to this particular defendant, we're going to show that Dominic Johnson was the catalyst for this incident. He was in the trailer. Also Noted for the record. He was in the trailer with Austin Barrett, Bradley Renfro, and David Grunwald. And he was the one who came up with the idea to ambush and beat up David Grunwald. David's la David Grunwald's last contact with the outside world on his phone was 8.10 p.m. that evening. And before that, there is an exchange of texts between Dominic Johnson, who was in the camper trailer, and Eric Elmendinger, who was multitasking in the house as far as dealing with David Evans's issue, and also interacting with Dominic Johnson. And the red is a little bit hard to read, but this is the exchange that took place between Dominic Johnson and Eric Elmendinger. Johnson texts Elmendinger saying, we're at the camper. Dominic Johnson texts Elmendinger saying, we just got locked in. Dominic Johnson texts Eric Elmendinger saying, are you coming inside? Dominic Johnson texts Eric Elmendinger at 8.09, could I borrow a Thule, which you will find out means a gun. Dominic <coughs> Johnson texts Eric Elmendinger and says, let me get that 4.0 referring to the Ruger 40 caliber semi-automatic pistol that Eric Elmendinger was possessing in the house. Dominic Johnson texts Eric Elmendinger the words, like on your nig, I kind of need it. Dominic Johnson at 811 texts Eric Elmendinger, if anything happens, you're not going to get involved and you're going to get it back. Again, referring to the Ruger 40 caliber person, uh, pistol. 
Dominic Johnson at 815, text Eric Elman and I can't talk to you in person if you want to be in, let in on something. And then later, the texts get more urgent. Dominic Johnson at 816 to Eric Elmendinger, I gotta act fast, like RM fast, right now fast. Um, and then later, the conversations on the text cease, and they, uh, Eric Elmendinger says to Dominic Johnson to start Snapchat chatting instead of texting or providing information over Facebook. We will present evidence of the guns involved in this incident. There were actually two guns involved. The defendant, Ann Austin Barrett, had another gun in the trailer. And that gun was a Springfield XDM semi-automatic pistol in a nine millimeter caliber. Um, the reason why, we will show the reason why Dominic Johnson wanted the Ruger 40 caliber is because the XDM uh, had a polymer frame, a plastic frame, while the Ruger was a heavier gun. It was all metal construction, as you can see from the, from the photographs. Johnson, as you saw from the text, told Eric Almeninger that this was an urgent situation, that he needed the 4.0. And Almeninger obliged and brought the Ruger to the camper. And this was the result of what they did to David with the guns. Um, the Ruger is all metal. It's got some sharp edges, but in particular to the Ruger, it's got a lanyard loop at the base of the grip, which is circular and has a sharp edge in and of itself. And this is where some major decisions are made. David is beat up very bad. He is bleeding. He is losing consciousness. And the group, the evidence will show the group all This was the pivot point in this case. David was hurt so bad that the group had to make a decision. Um, take him to his parents' house, take him to Victoria's father's house, take him to the hospital, take him anywhere else. But they decided that they did not want to get into trouble. So they decided as a group that they were gonna eliminate David because he was two things. He was the victim of a severe beating, and he was also the witness to a severe beating. Now, this group didn't have any vehicles. So what they did is they took David, and they stuffed him into his Bronco, and they all got into the Bronco with him. And they took him to a very remote area um, down seven, over seven miles down Knick River Road. You will find out through the evidence that along the way they disabled David's phone, probably by breaking it, because there was no further communications uh, over David's phone. 
when they got to this area, of course, the, this boat was during the daylight, but by this time it was dark. They take David, who is injured and bleeding. They march him into the woods. And likely when he's pleading for his life, one of them took the Springfield 9mm, pointed it at David Grunwald's head, and put a 9mm bullet in his head, thereby causing David's death. After this happened, after they did this, they drive across the valley to Devin Peterson's house um, for advice, for gas cans, and also they dropped off Austin Barrett at, De at Devin Peterson's, perhaps because he was the shooter. After they went to Peterson's house, they went to the Holiday gas station and they purchased gas. And Renfro, as you see here on the video from the Holiday Gas Station, pays for the gas at 10.54 p.m. on November 13, 2016. While they were at the gas station, Defendant Johnson is on the phone talking to Devin Peterson, getting further advice. They get back in the Bronco, they being Defendant Johnson, Eric Almendinger, and Bradley Renfro. They drive it to a remote area in Meadow Lakes at the base of Baldy at the end of Sightsea Road, and they destroy the Bronco by burning it. After they burn the Bronco, they get a cab ride. Just Don noted for the record and overruled. Thank you. Again, it's photographs. Thank you. Dominic Johnson, this defendant, is the one who uses his phone to call the camp company. Uh, they had, after they burned the, the Bronco, they actually walked a ways, and they ended up at the Little Sioux Bridge by Schrock Road. And just before 1 a.m., and this is now on November 14th, and Dominic Johnson's the one, the one that calls the cab. Now, they didn't have enough money to make it all the way back to Palmer. So ironically, they get dropped off at the very same spot that David Grunwald picked up David Evans earlier in the day near Pioneer Pizza. After that, they walk to a friend's house, Alyssa Bledsoe's house in Equestrian Acres. Uh, she, living with her parents, there was a shed on, her, on their property, and there was also a camper trailer on her property, likewise, a different one. And the group um, hung out in the shed, also in the, in the camper trailer, and eventually the other part of the group, Austin Barrett, eventually joined them a while later, but he eventually joined them. And the group joked around and partied and carry on, carried on as if nothing happened. Now, the guns, the Springfield and the Ruger, eventually made it back to the advisor's house. They made it back to Devin Peterson's house. Uh, fortunately, the police searched Devin Peterson's house before he got rid of those guns. The trailer where this happened, the trailer uh, that belonged to Rodney Almendinger was bleached, uh, what they thought was thoroughly bleached. And also, the rug from the trailer ended up burned. Um, David is still not found at this point, obviously. Uh, the, at this, at this point, police are involved, the DA's office is involved. There is uh, a plan to commence a grand jury investigation to determine who killed David Grunwald and also maybe to help find David Grunwald. Um, and then, on December 2nd, 2016, uh, there is more involvement by this defendant, Dominic Johnson. 
The evidence will prove, I already told you, that the evidence will prove that he was the catalyst, that he hatched this plan and he started the chain of events. And the evidence likewise will prove that he's, a, he's the other bookend, that to, a, to an extent he was at the end of this case. Now we know it's not the end of the case because we're still in the case, but the evidence will prove that to, the, to an extent he was at the end of the fact pattern. And that is because on December 2nd, 2016, he agreed to help the authorities locate David Brumley. And on the afternoon of December 2nd, 2016, he, along with a lawyer that he had at the time, um, led Sergeant Weggs in to a number of locations. Uh, in an effort to find David Grimley. First location, there was just a momentary pulling over of the cars, but nobody got out. The second location uh, was off the Knick River Road uh, where people got out and looked, but nothing was found. And ultimately, they ended up at the third location, which was the one shown in the aerial photo. Now, there was a little bit of snow on the ground. It was getting dark. Um, it was late afternoon at this point. And there was a search in the area, people walking around, and David Grunwald was not found. And just before the efforts were going to be abandoned, and it was supposed to snow that evening, Sergeant Wegson took four or five more steps in one direction and eventually found David Brumley. David was on the ground, covered with snow. This photo shows David when the snow was swept off of him. He was covered by a thin layer of snow. Um, he had the same clothes on that he had in the cars that he he had his jeans on, he had the orange pullover he was wearing, and he had slippers on. David was not intending to be outside on the evening of the 13th. He was running people around. He was intending to come home to get ready because it was a school night, so he didn't even have any winter gear or winter shoes on. The questions that may came up, come up during the state's presentation of evidence, who shot David Grunwald? Through the evidence, we don't know. We're not gonna be able to answer that question and we may never find, find out which of the people shot David Grunwald. Why was David pistol whipped is another question that may come up, we don't know. We don't know if somebody got angry at David. We don't know if somebody was trying to prove himself to the others. We don't know if, the, if there was a plan that originated earlier in the day before those texts or earlier in the week. We're not gonna be able to prove that to you. That's gonna remain a question mark. Maybe David got beat up because people want to take his Bronco because they didn't have a vehicle. That, that's another possibility that may come up through the evidence. As far as was this plan in advance, we don't know. And the evidence won't be able to, to, to answer that question. We will show that there were some communications in addition to David Evans texting with David Grunwald. We'll be able to show there were some communications between David Evans and the defendant, Dominic Johnson, earlier in the day. But as far as these questions that are left unopened, um, the state, because of the evidence, is not worried about these issues. The law, as we discussed in jury selection, the law is equipped to handle a situation where the group, where a group under the cloak of secrecy commits a terrible crime. We talked during jury selection about the Alaska statute. I'm not gonna delve into the law because this is opening, but this is gonna be part of our evidence. 
Alaska Statute 1116.110, subparagraph 2 reads, a person is legally accountable for the conduct of another constituting an offense if, with the intent to promote or facilitate the commission of the offense, the person either solicits another to commit the offense or does something to aid or abet the other in either planning or committing the offense. There are more instructions as to, as to aiding and abetting, which I won't go into at this time. In conclusion, as far as what we will be able to prove beyond any doubt in this case, uh, we will prove through the evidence that this was an intentional and unanimous group effort by Dominic Johnson, Eric Allmendinger, Austin Barrett, and Bradley Renfro, but especially between Dominic Johnson and Eric Allmendinger, as you've seen through the text. And it was a unanimous and intentional effort to ambush David, to pistol whip David, to decide to kill David, to force David into the Bronco and kidnap him, to march David into the dark woods while he was injured from the pistol weapon, to shoot David, to steal David's Bronco, to burn David's Bronco, and to cover up the crime by giving Peterson the guns, torching the Bronco, and bleaching the trailer and burning the rug. We will also prove that one person could not have done this. Eric Almendinger alone could not have done this. Dominic Johnson alone could not have done this. Austin Barrett alone could not have done this. Bradley Renfro alone could not have done this. We will prove that this was done because there were four people doing it and they also had two firearms. We will also prove through the evidence that not only did they do it as a group, but they were extremely comfortable with their decisions, with their unanimous decisions. And this is gonna be evident, evidence through the evidence we present to you as to the fact that they continued to party together they continued to associate together. They continued to carry on as if nothing happened. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, we will prove that Dominic Johnson and his buddies, as a close-knit group of wannabe gangbangers. Objection. Objection noted, overruled. As a closely-knit group of wannabe gangbangers destroyed David's David Gwenwald's life and irreparably damaged David's family and friends. Thank you. Oh, you want to come forward? There are some facts in this case that we can agree on with the state. We agree that David Grunwald was murdered. Who's responsible is going to be the main question. Whether or not people acted as a group the entire time is going to be a question. My client, Bobby Johnson, has some involvement. You're going to hear evidence of what he did, and you're also going to hear evidence of what he did not do. We're going to ask you to pay close attention to all the evidence in this case because it's important. We're going to ask you to listen closely to both sides. This is an emotional case. 
going to hear emotional testimony. You're going to see photographs that you're going to have an emotional response to. But you still need to listen closely to all the evidence in this case. And still listen to both sides. And not get caught up in the emotion. At the appropriate time, we're going to come back. We're going to talk to you. And we're going to talk about what the evidence did show in this case. And just as importantly, what it didn't show. Thank you. Okay, members of the jury, we're going to take a quick recess. I did want to give you just one general instruction.